work it, make it, do it, make sense. So, uh, welcome, and thank you so much for having me. I've, I haven't been to London for a very long time, and I've totally missed everything that's different between London and Sweden, where I come from. So when I came up from the subway system a few hours ago, I realized you're driving on the other side of the road, which really terrifies me, because I'm, I'm really good at jaywalking, but I have to. I'm not going to do that for a while. When I was a kid, I was maybe five or six years old, my mom used to say that I was special. And I quickly realized that I wasn't special at all. I was just special to her. A few years later, I went to high school and later college, and my teachers used to say that I was special. I wasn't special at all. I was just an average, obnoxious teenager running around in the hallway making mischief. But at the age of 40, I can for, I came for the first time in my life say that I'm, uh, that I'm special. And what makes me special is this chip implant that I have in my hand. It's tiny. It's about 12 millimeters. Maybe you in the front row can see. It's 12 millimeters long and 2 millimeters wide. And it's a glass capsule that contains an NFC chip. And I can even move it around a little bit. And if you're interested, you can come up afterwards and you can, you can scan your phone if you like and read it. Or you can touch it or just move it around a little bit. <laughs> when I had it implanted, it was in the crevice between the thumb and index finger. But it's, uh, so I don't really feel it, but I have a habit of actually like, by touching it, it's, it's quite comfortable. And that's probably why it's been misplaced. So it's, I've been wearing it for about how, a year and a half, and it's slowly, slowly, slowly moved up here. Uh, but I think it's stabilizing. Um, I hope so. Uh, maybe six months ago, I could even move it three centimeters, which is, which is quite terrible. Uh, but come up afterwards and, and have a look uh, and have a feel. So how did this end up in my hand, you might ask? And 18 months ago, I was at another conference where biohacking, as it's called, was in the limelight. And they offered workshops and sessions on biohacking. And they even offered free chip implants on the exhibition floor. And being on the um, forefront of technology, I, 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 was, I know I was going to do this. I was so excited, and I, well, I, knew, I knew I was going to do it. Um, I was even so eager that I ended up first in line. There were many people doing the implant that day, but I ended up first in line, and the Swedish television was there covering the story. So on the left side is a screenshot from the, uh, from the news just before the procedure. So that's my hand on the left. On the right side um, is an x-ray of... His, it's a guy called Amal Grafstad. He's the founder of the, the biohacking community, and that's his hand. Um, so, I, a little disclaimer, I find this extremely exciting. Um, I'm absolutely sure that this is going to be the future. But I'm also sure that this is the first wave hitting us, like any other technology. So, this is probably going to fade away, and then it's going to come again and again. So, this is just the first wave. Um, hopefully, I will live long enough to, to see this happening. But I'm also a bit terrified because this is just an extension of IoT. So this is just another device in my body that can collect data. Well, in the future, this could probably collect data. So that's just an extension of IoT. And if you've been reading up on IoT, you might have heard about the security issues. So that's a bit terrifying. Uh, privacy, uh, also a huge problem. You could probably, if you come up afterwards and you have a phone that can read and write NFC, you could, you could write anything you wanted on my hand, and then you can lock it. You can lock the, the, the chip implant, so I won't be able to rewrite it. But please don't do that. So I think this is exciting, and I think it's terrifying, but at the conference, I knew that I was going to do this. But I still had this thought in the back of my head, like, is, is this a good thing? So I spent several hours reading up on it, making sure that this is really safe for me, that this is something I want to do. 
So I was convinced that, that, that this was a good thing. But I still want to make sure that it was really okay. So I called my wife and I said, um, hey, I'm at this conference where they're offering free chip implants. And my wife, in his, she's in the pharmaceutical business, and she's like, well, her response was this. <laughs> and I want to put this in perspective. Like, the stupidest study could mean a lot of things. But put, to put this in perspective, you should know that I've actually bicycled five kilometers on a busy German highway by accident. So, you know, if this is the stupidest study, you get a point. My point with this is that I think we're both right. I think from her perspective, she's working with the government and the FDA. This is just crazy. But from my point of view, being just a simple swing developer, it makes sense. But I guess if you want to do this, you will have to read up on it, make sure that you really want to do it, and make the call, see what happens. <clears throat> Here is a picture of the 64 people accepting the chip implant that very day. And it happens to be 64 people, not because it's a good number for a developer conference, but it's the amount of implants you can do during a day. And the conference was going on for three days, but the guy doing the implants had to leave for a cyborg uh, uh, conference in Germany. So he could only stay for one day. So 64 people got the chip implant. Uh, I know many of these and have a lot of friends with the chip implant, and only one of them have chosen to remove the chip. And the reason he removed it was that, was that he's doing a lot of heavy lifting. He's out in the woods doing things, I don't know. And when he bends his hand, it scratches the bone. And that's a little bit uncomfortable. I don't have to tell you that, but it's, 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 um, it doesn't feel very nice. So, so far, I haven't heard of any accidents or anything. It's, it's just a glass capsule in my hand with NFC. But I have a few use cases I'm going to show you. And we're not talking about NFC chip implants. I'm going to show you some real things that people have implanted in their hands and in their heads and in their bodies. That's really not approved by the, by the government, but it's, it's quite fun. So I'm feeling very safe using this one. So just quickly, what is biohacking? And there are two subgroups. The first one is do-it-yourself biology. That's where you do experiments with plants, for example. It's been around forever. And I don't know anything about it. I'm not really interested in that. The second group is what we call grinders. And that's the movement that's, that's been growing the last years. And grinders are usually... You usually say biohackers, and you mean grinders. Um, but that's the two subgroups. And grinders insert everything in the bodies, as you will see. A few weeks ago, I was, um, I was on my way to another conference to speak about biohacking, and my mom texted me asking, what are you doing? She didn't know that I was going to a conference. And I, I said, well, I'm going to this conference to speak on biohacking. And I didn't expect her to know anything about it. She's getting old. But, but um, she answered me in a text saying that I listened to a radio show for an hour last, last uh, night uh, on biohacking. So she's been catching up. She knew everything about biohacking. And I was like, whoa, impressive. And she texted me again saying, I mean, I totally understand that this is the future. This is, this is going to be magic. I've, I understand what you can do with it. And then she texted again, and I can't believe that all you have to do is insert a clip. And I'm like, a clip? Really? So she's been listening to a radio show for an hour, and she's been hearing a clip instead of a chip. So, so you know, it's, it's not a clip. We're not going to insert clips in our, in our heads. That was, I didn't tell her about it, so I didn't correct her. So the next time she's having dinner with her friends, they're going to discuss the clip. If you're interested in getting a chip like this, uh, there are two ways you can do it. In, um, Sweden, we have a, in Sweden, we have a growing community. Biohacking in Sweden is really huge. And there is even they have something that they call chip implant parties. So they announce the party, you go there, they will give you a session on biohacking, and then they will offer you implants. The cost is usually around 100 to 200 euros. Uh, I'm not sure if that's possible around here. The other way is go to dangerousthings.com. Uh, and buy one of these uh, implant uh, packs. It contains everything you need. Um, it contains the syringe, um, plastic gloves, everything you need except someone doing it. And I wouldn't suggest that, that you do it yourself, because it's, it's, if you've been donating blood, you know the needle is quite, it's quite big. 
So you should, you should go to someone else. And when I say someone else, I don't mean a doctor. You can go to a doctor, but they would probably refuse you because they have something called the ethical code. And you can try a vet as well, but they have the same code. So you should probably go to a, a piercer or body modification artist. They will do it. So two ways. Um, the cost, I've bought one of these packages, and I think it's around uh, 100 to 150 euros. There are two types of chips you can insert today. Uh, it's RFID that's been around for a long time, and it's usually what you, do, what you use when you have entrance systems. So if you want to get access to your office, you can insert an RFID tag. You can just swipe your hand, open the door. And then there is NFC that I'm wearing, and that's usually used for smart cards, like when you go to the tube, uh, go to the gym. That's usually NFC. Uh, it's close range, so you have to come up, you have to be really close to read it. Um, it's, it could be a problem reading my chip if you, have a, if you have a phone. You will have to stay here for a while. We're really testing it. Uh, at the conference, there was one guy who couldn't decide, so he put one chip in each hand. That's also a possibility. It's passive. There is no battery. There is no Wi-Fi. It's just, it's just NFC in a glass capsule. But that's going to change. I will show you that. I use a tool called NFC Tools Pro. You can download it. It's available for Android. I'm not sure about uh, iOS. And you can write and read whatever you want to do, whatever you want to the chip. I've uh, chosen to read my, write my, my business card. So if you swipe your phone afterwards, you will get my business card. So that's the basics of, of, of biohacking. It's NFC, it's in your hand, and it's, it's, it's really not that interesting yet. So I'm going to show you other things that you can do with it. <clears throat> and we're going to start by discussing the things people are doing today, and then we're going to go into the future and discuss what could be possible. So we start with today, and then we end with tomorrow. That might be 50 years, 100 years, I don't know. So the first of all, you can just open your phone. That's pretty easy. Uh, Android has something called Smart Lock. And you can pair your uh, phone with a device. So you can see that I have a Volvo, I have a Kia car, and I have something called My Hand that, that is a trusted device. That's obviously my hand. So I can just swipe my hand to unlock my phone. I'm not sure if that's useful, but it's pretty funny. This is my friend, uh, Hannes Sjöblad. He's one of the leading biohackers in Sweden. Uh, he's part of the movement. And this is him getting to his office. He's quite happy. <laughs> so if you get a chip, you will be happy. So that's uh, probably the most common use case for the chip implants, just opening doors. And it's pretty cool. Then there is uh, NFC-enabled locks. On the right side, you see just a lock that you can use for your bike or your locker room or whatever. On the left side, is a little bit more advanced lock that you can put in your home. So you can actually throw, throw away your keys and just use your hands to open the door. Uh, here's another Swedish biohacker, Andreas. And he's been collaborating with SAS, airline um, company. And the mission was to get on board an airplane without showing his boarding card once. So every time they asked for his boarding card, he could just swipe his hand. And he was on the plane. They have, um, if you're a gold member, they have um, um, this gold card that is NFC enabled. And you can just use your hand instead. He told me to tell you that this is not available. You can't, you know, the next time you take an SAS flight, you can't just ask them to, like, code your hand. It's just for him. It's a proof of concept, but it shows the possibilities of NFC in your hand. They've been doing the same kind of collaboration with the subway system in Stockholm, so they can gain access to the subway system just swiping their hand. It's the same thing. It's just NFC. You just need to ask the subway owner to, to, to approve your ID that you stored on your chip. A little bit more interesting, perhaps, it's a friend of mine, Patrick, so they've been doing some custom software, some custom hardware, and then they went on the web and they purchased something, and they paid using Bitcoin, and they authorized the payment by swiping his hand again. So it's, it's all about identification. So that's the basics, um, the basic thing we can do today. It's, um, 
It's really about identification. You identify yourself as someone um, like you swipe your cards. So now we're leaving the comfort zone. So for every use case I'm going to show you, it will be, depending on what you think, it will be better or worse, um, or more terrifying. So here's another biohacker. His name is, um, well, he's, um, he won to achieve night vision. So he dripped um, kind of a cellulose substance into his eye bulbs. And the eye, eye bulbs then, um, um, he waited for, I mean, I think it was 20 minutes until it was absorbed by the eye bulb. And then he, went, then he went outside in the night. And he was asked to pick out 50 people hiding in the surrounding. And he picked out every one of them compared to a test group that didn't do this, and they could only pick out 20 people out of 50. So he successfully achieved night vision. I should also tell you that I, I read the report, and 20 days afterwards, he was back to normal, so no injuries. They're, doing, um, they, they're inserting magnetic implants in their fingertips. I'm not really sure why you would do this. But I've, I've, read on, I've, I've read two use cases where it might be useful. The first one was someone walking around in New York City, and suddenly they felt this tingling sensation in their fingertips. And they did some research, and currently they, it appeared that they've been walking across some kind of electrical junction or subway system underneath, so they could pick that up, if you need to know that. The other use case is someone doing... He was a... a um, some kind of geology student, and they were in Tanzania doing some kind of uh, job there. And he could actually pick out the, uh, the amount of iron in the soil by just swiping his hands and see how much stuck to his hands. And he told in the report that he's been walking around just doing this for fun, and they were actually able to, f to find places where they wouldn't think of looking if it wasn't for him. But again, I'm not sure. I wouldn't do it. I'm pretty satisfied with this one. The next case um, is echolocation. So that's the sound system that bats and dolphins use to navigate. So they send out some kind of um, ultrasonic uh, sound that is reflected on the objects around them. And when it gets back, they can see where the objects are, where they're moving, and the size of them. So this is uh, Rick Lee, and he wanted to recreate that. And the reason is that he's going blind, so he needs some kind of uh, a way to navigate. So it's going to recreate echolocation. And if you look at the image on the right side, so what he did is he bought this ultrasonic range finder and he put it on, on his stomach. And then he plugged in the three and a half millimeter jack. So all the sound information will be transported uh, to the transmitter where it's amplified by the battery. And then it will go into the coil that he's wearing around his neck. And what happens when you have electricity going back and forth in a coil like that? Well, it, it will emit an electromagnetic field. And if you look closely on the left side, that's his ear, obviously. You can see a protrusion right there. That's another magnet that is um, implanted very close to his inner ear. So uh, the magnet will respond to the electromagnetic field going in and out, just like sound would. So you can go around being blind, hearing things with this device. That's pretty cool. A question. Why would you do this? You could just as well have used earphones. Any guesses? You don't lose them. Huh? Headphones, you can lose them. Yeah, that's one reason. The other reason is that being a biohacker, how much fun would it be? I mean. This is obviously more fun. So I'm not sure. I haven't read any news on him, so I don't think he will have a crystal clear like sound image of everything, but hopefully he will be able to detect some of the obstacles around him. Here's another guy. It's always a guy. Uh, and he's really tired of these uh, earphones that we're using, the Bluetooth earphones. They they're getting smaller, but they're still pretty clumsy, and they don't look good. So he's thinking, why can't we just implant the same thing next to our air? So he's having a... So what he did is, he, um, he bought the smallest earpiece he can find, and then he removed the cover. So what, you, what you're looking at there is just the, 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 the necessary parts. 
And then he bought a, there is a, a battery, and he also added a bone conductor, so you can actually hear as well. And then he's going to coat this in some biosafe uh, uh, cover and insert it next to his ear. So that means that, well, he figures that it, the skin is light enough that the sound will actually go through. Right there. So he can just speak and it will be picked up. And the bone conductor will just do the rest. So he can actually set an alarm at 6 o'clock in the morning and no one will hear it except himself. Um, he can also walk around in the middle of the city just speaking with someone, but he won't see anything. It will just be him. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. <laughs> Do you see anything on the image that looks suspicious? Except the, the coin. That's not going to be included, obviously. Uh, the coin is just for measurement. But do you see anything that is, might be suspicious? Well, the battery. Um, I'm not sure if you read about the Samsung incident. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure this is a good idea. And the last thing I read on his blog, and it was actually the last thing, is don't do, don't do this. I'm going to be the test person for this. And then there were no updates. But, I, but, I'm, but I'm sure it was good. Uh, another thing that is, I'm not sure how he's going to solve it, but um, so you have to charge to this. And it's, it's like the induction. You use some kind of induction to charge the battery. But have you charged a, a toothbrush? How long does that take? Forever, yes. So he will have to walk around with the charger to his head. Or maybe he will have one in his pillow or something. I don't know. But this is not a, a perfect case. My mother's got a pacemaker. They changed that battery once every two years. Yeah. I know it's a bit... Yeah. So in the future, it's going to be possible to have a battery for a long time. Yes. Just a quick question. How many of you would have a chip implant? I'm not going to force you, just a, just a question. So a few of you. How many of you would do this? Mm, maybe. A couple in the back. How many of you would do this? It's actually an arm. And what you're seeing is, I'm going to explain what this is, but it's the size of a pack of cards. And it was implanted in a, again in a, a cyborg uh, conference in Germany. Um, I'm pretty sure the tattoo was there before. So this is, this is the Shikada, and it's a device that was made only for him. So there's a company doing this. It's really not approved by the government. But they've been uh, um, working on this one for a very long time. And it's capable of, of picking up temperature, and I think blood, blood pressure as well. But the temperature is the key here. So it can pick up temperature and transmit it to his mobile phone. And he is using it for two things. The first one is his, uh, the temperature is, is, is transmitted to the mobile phone that is then connected to his uh, home. So he will, uh, depending on which room he is in, and, and his body temperature, the, the temperature will be adjusted in his room, which is pretty cool. But that's not the reason why I really like this. The, the, the second use case is this device is actually capable of doing some simple processing. And when it thinks when it thinks that he's about to get a fever, it will send an alert. So if the temperature is slowly rising, he will be notified before actually knowing this. And the reason I really like this, uh, think about it. What if we could have implants that were just a millimeter, that were capable of doing this? You could actually get information of when you're about to get sick. And just, this is temperature. Think about all of the other things we can do with this. He, um, it was designed to stay in his arm for 180 days, and it was uh, battery constraints. He, he took it out after 90 days, and there were two reasons. Batteries, he ran out of battery, and he, he was also getting uh, anxiety attacks, which makes sense. Um, one thing that's been bothering me, uh, again, I have a question for you. Uh, this is an American guy doing this in a cyber conference in, uh, in Germany. How the, how the heck did he get home? So 
I haven't been able to find the answer to the question. So I've been in the States wearing this and going through security. It's, not a, it's a no-brainer. This is just glass and some NFC. But that one, I have no idea. So, but I'm going to... I might have to email him and ask. Maybe he's still stuck in Germany. Well, he, he, he had it removed, so he's home, probably. Um, here's another guy. He's suffering from chronic cluster headaches, which is terrible. And he's implanted this a neurostimulator in his brain. And it's remote control. So whenever he's hit by one of these cluster headaches, he can just turn it on, and it will stimulate his, his brain which is pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> he had it removed, because <laughs> he was also suffering from panic attacks. <laughs> but I think the reason you get panic attacks from wearing these things is knowing that you're alone. It's really only you doing it. But if everyone was wearing a thing like this, then maybe we'd be okay. And especially if we know that it was uh, authorized or, or approved by the, by the government. But wearing things like this is like, it's a bit scary, I guess. So now it gets more interesting. So this is a LA-based company called Kernel. And if you're out running or bicycling and you're in an accident and you hit your head, there is a chance that you will have a hard time remembering things. And if you have some kind of degenerative disease like Alzheimer's, you will, you will start to forget things. And I'm not an expert, but it's very simple. It's, uh, you have a part of the brain that is responsible for short-term memory, and then you have a part that is responsible for the long-term memory. And in between is the hippocampus. And when you hit your brain, the hippocampus might be, be broken in some way. So they figured, why can't we just try to um, map the patterns being sent from short-term memory to long-term memory? And if we can do that, maybe we can, if we can recreate the process, we can just insert some kind of computer instead of the hippocampus to help us remember. Now, you might think that this is crazy. How many of you think it's crazy? More than five. Don't be shy. This is really, you're in the brain, you're inserting a, some kind of computer in your brain. But the thing is, this is, um, they're under the FDA, uh, um, um, uh, trial. So the FDA is about to approve this. And once they approve it, it will be available to doctors to insert. So it's considered safe, which is extremely um, interesting. My only concern here is, will we be able to say, okay, so we're going to help people with injuries or some kind of uh, disease? Are we going to stop there? Well, we know from history that if there's a possibility, we're going to take it. So why won't we implant this in every human? So in the future, you might not be able to forget. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, terrifying. There are things in my life that I want to forget, like the biking on the uh, highway. But this is coming. So this might be in the future, a few years from, here, from now. Bionic eyes. There are two companies working with this. So they have actually successfully hijacked the uh, optical nerve. And for blind people, people who could see in the beginning, so the brain knows how to process images, so you have to see. You have to be able to see in the few, in, uh, when you were born, but then you've gone blind. You can actually put a camera instead of the eye, and you can send images to the optical nerve. So you can see some kind of grayscale. This is not a 4K display. This is like very grayscale. But again, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. What if we can have this? What about, I mean, night vision, optical zoom? And we can see all the, uh, the entire color spectrum. And again, this might sound like, okay, this is just crazy, but there are two companies doing this, and they're also under FDA investigation uh, or trial. And once they succeed, this might be something we can use. It's probably going to take um, some time, but it's around the corner. Um, this is Professor Warwick. <clears throat> I think he's based somewhere in the UK. And he's, he's, he's been doing this kind of biohacking for ages, and he's really, really good at this. So what you're seeing here is his hand, and he's um, 
insert like a mesh of interceptors. They intercept everything that's going, that's going back and forth in his hand. And then on the left side, you see a, a, a mechanical uh, hand. And he's been able to link them by a computer. So when he's doing this movement, the mechanical arm would do the same. So, so it's a mimic. They're doing the exact same thing, so they're able to understand what's happening in our, our, uh, the, the signals going back and forth. If I was him, I would be very happy doing that, just that. But he, um, he wanted more, so he went home and asked his wife to do the same procedure. And then, then they were trying to link the two hands together. And he said that he couldn't control his wife arm, wife's arm, which is good, I guess. But they could have, he, he had this, again, this tingling sensation whenever she was moving her hand. So the signal went through, but he couldn't control the hand. So that's, um, we're getting there. So a few challenges, <clears throat> a few things we have to solve um, to make this happen in the future. The first one is batteries. We don't want to have batteries. We need some kind of um, uh, energy harvesting uh, technology. And the first that comes to, comes to mind is just body temperature. Maybe we can reuse that so we don't need batteries. We need something else in NFC. Uh, we need, we can't be passive. We need tiny computers. And that's another thing we have to solve. Uh, we need connectivity, not Wi-Fi, something else. Bluetooth is really, um, is really not good enough. I'm thinking long range, so if you go into a, a store to buy something, it could pick this up. That's the kind of range I'm thinking. We also make sure that this is um, stationary. I don't want thousands of, thousands of these moving around in my body, so they have to be stationary, and they have to be extremely small, like millimeters, not even that. But we're getting there, and maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, we're going we're gonna to have the technology to make this happen. So what if we had all that? What could we do? And I have, um, this is where we're going to tomorrow. And I have a, a, a use case that I think that we will see. So, so I have a kid, and I'm thinking when he's having a kid, or he's having a his kid is having a kid, so 50 years from now, perhaps. Imagine, okay, so imagine my son or one of your kids. The second they're becoming parents themselves, so they're at the hospital, they just gave birth, they're happy. The doctor would probably pick up the kid and do the usual check, you know, 10 toes, uh, 9 fingers, 10, 10 fingers. And then they're going to go back to the parent and they're going to ask, do you want the standard upgrade? And they're going to say, yes, obviously. And then the doctor will insert, again, thousands of these microchips in the body, everywhere. So it's going to be in the lungs, might be in the heart, might be in the brain, everywhere. And then we we'll go fast forward, maybe 30 years, and something happens in the body. Maybe there is something happening with the, uh, you know, in a specific part, say there's a, a, an abnormal amount of cells being created, so we're talking about cancer, we could pick that up. And since we have the connectivity, we can just transmit that message to our doctor that will respond. And re the response might even be like, fix this, you don't even have to know about it. It's, it's in the future, I know, but it's, it's, it might happen. And I wouldn't mind doing that. I think that's the reason I do this, because I really think that could happen, and that would be a, a huge benefit. Again, I'm not, there's thousands of problems we have to, we have to solve, like security and, and privacy, but I think this is going to happen. This makes me re really happy. So we're talking about longer, happy lives. We can actually live longer. And you know, they, uh, uh, they think, they're guessing that the average age of children today is going to be 100 years, and the first kid who's going to be 200 years is already born. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Maybe we, maybe we were not destined to be 300 years old. But we have, to, we have to see what it means. How many of you have heard of Neuralace? It's been in news. It's, uh, how many of you have heard of Elon Musk? He's behind this. And the problem here is that whenever he says he's going to do something, he actually succeeds. So Neuralace is, um, he's concerned about AI. 
that's the problem he's trying to solve because AI is going to be uh, it's going to be superior. So we're going to be like pets to AI in the future, and he's really concerned about that. Um, and his solution is the neural lace, and it's basically just a mesh of interceptors around our brain, picking up every signal going in and out. And he's proposing that we could just uh, expose an API from our brain that we can connect to the computer, so we will have direct access to everything the AI knows. So we will be part of the AI, or the AI will be part of us. A bit scary. And that's, uh, I think he started a company around this, uh, and he's, he's working on it. I think he has other, he has other things to do as well, but, um, but this is one of the things he's working on. So as soon as he's uh, put people on Mars, uh, this is his ne next thing. Um, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's a bright future, and scary. Both. Questions? Hmm? Uh, you were talking about the implants that babies can have when they're born, but the thing is that today the software and hardware it, uh, it, it, it improves really, really fast. So that means that the moment that the implant is there, in like one year, it's going to be. Yes. So, not updated. How, how do you think it's going to be? So, hardware upgrades. I have absolutely no idea. I don't know how to do that. That's going to be an obvious problem, yes. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. Um, there's actually a new type coming that it's, uh, uh, that it's, there's a new type of chip coming that is uh, Java card enabled. And Java card is what you're using in the, in the credit cards. So I'm thinking about upgrading, but that would mean that I would take this out and put in a new one. I'm not super fond of that thought, but uh, so yeah, upgrades, it's going to be a big problem. Yes. Yeah. Can you not just go take his and then get his flights for him? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, exactly. The guy uh, embarking on the aircraft. Exactly. So, you can just read his chip and then go on the airplane. So, we have zero security. Yeah. That's what we're working on right now. In the back. How, again? So problem with the, the insurance, medical insurance. I haven't tested it yet, so I'm, um, I'm not sure. I guess it depends. Uh, I think that in Sweden you're pretty safe. It doesn't matter what you do because you're covered. But I know that you know, other places won't be as uh, accepting. And I know that biohacking is forbidden in, in certain states in the, in, in, in the United States, for example. So. And I'm not sure what happens if you actually go get a chip and then hurt yourself. And again, what happens if I'm in a car accident and, and my hand is, 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 is injured and the, the glass capsule is broken? What would that mean? Will they, um, they will take care of it, but it will be, the, the consequences will be terrible. Yes? So again, it's uh, privacy and security, and so in a in a in a not so bright future, this could actually be used to control people. You mean, if we implant thousand of these and and the government gets control of them, that might be a problem. No. So um, again, it's a bit about privacy and, and other governments that are not like Sweden. That's going to be a huge problem. And I think you don't have to look at 
other countries. If you look at Sweden, if you implant like the, the Cicada that was measuring temperature, what if this, the insurance company get hold of that information? They can actually raise the, the cost for your insurance if they see that you have some kind of a temperature issue. So, and what if everyone want to get your data? So it's about privacy and you have to protect your data. So yes, there is a future that is not so bright as well. So we shouldn't be like, we shouldn't all do this. We should actually think about it. And again, I think this is the first wave and So some things are too dangerous, absolutely. But I think if we look at history, we're really bad at not doing bad things. So if, if there's an opportunity that might end in chaos, we're actually going to take it. I mean, that's, the, that's how we are as humans, unfortunately. So I think that this is, um, I think the best way forward is to actually investigate and then maybe say, no, that's also an alternative. But it's, it's really hard. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think we're going to be able to replace um, most of our bodies in the future. Yes. Yes. So there are other problems. Um, so what happens if you introduce a bug? It's not the same thing as introducing a bug in a, in, a, in a swing application. It's a little bit more severe. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's not enough testing it a little bit longer. We have to have something else in place to actually make sure that it works. Again? Again, I can hear. Yeah. So you can't upgrade. So you will have the bug forever. Yeah, that will be terrible. So we need, to, we need a way to... So if we have all these sensors, they must be able to communicate. So there will be some kind of exit point where you have the, where you, where you have the, like the Wi-Fi. And they will be able to communicate. So there shouldn't be a part of the mesh that is unreachable. But again, I, I, it's, I don't know how to do that. It's, it's really tricky. Yes? So there's the technical aspects that we can get into easily. But the ethical issues that you're starting to point towards, when you kind of explore them and we've, we've done it at a very basic level and got it wrong with data privacy, yeah. is there a working Uh, no, this is uh, this is done in the basement, so there is really nothing going on there, and I don't think that any government will approve it today because it's really just starting out. So no ethics, um, no people are just it's like a, a hype. People are really oh this is so cool, see what we can do with it, and I think that's that's an error we're making. We have to think about ethics as well, and this might lead to. Um, People, in, people in, in, in Sweden, for example, that can afford this will be technologi technologically advanced compared to other uh, countries. And that, that doesn't make sense. It should be for everyone. We have more questions. Okay. Is all the information about the software and the hardware of the devices that we just saw available somewhere? Like they publish uh, information somewhere? Uh, just, just, just articles. Um, so it's not open source or anything. No. We had one in the back somewhere. Yeah. Um, what is the biohacking community's opinion on less permanent, um, not implants, but wearables? Uh, like wearables on the outside? Yeah, potentially sort of adhesive sensors or that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, people are looking at that as well. So it's kind of, it's part of the biohacking community. Um, so it's not, it's not shown that it's... No, no. And it makes sense to do it. I mean, if we can avoid putting things in our body, that would be so much better. 
So that, uh, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, in terms of the next step, how far are we from making payments from, with our card? Payments? Yes. I think uh, with a new chip coming uh, that is Java card enabled, it's just a matter of replacing every ATM, ATM in the world. <laughs> I mean, we could, we could actually do it because the Java card contains security and encryption. So it's, it's, it's the same as going with your... So if we don't, if we don't use the ATM, but you actually just swipe your hands uh, in a, one of the card readers, you could probably do that. But I'm not sure if anyone would actually write the data to your hand. That's the problem. So none of the uh, proprietary systems will allow you to, to use your hand. But, but it would be possible, yeah. But, so when is this card coming or this chip coming out? The Java card enabled chip is supposed to be here in 2017. I spoke with them and they said beginning of 2017, but I haven't heard anything so, but it's around the corner. Yes? Um, yes and no. I think people are interested in both. But people doing the, the, the biohacking are just inserting uh, cybernetic devices. But it's, there is an overlap, absolutely. And maybe uh, nanotechnology is actually a better way to go. It might be the case. Um, but it's still, it's, still, it's still so new and it's just a tiny group doing this. Like it's a couple of hundred in Sweden, so it's, it's really just got started. Um, one more question? Okay, thank you so much.